Um, in today's session, we're very pleased to have um, two papers under a theme that we called um, at the beginning of the series, other qualitative studies of lockdown from beyond the UK. So other people working with qualitative data, thinking about everyday life during um, the pandemic. And so we're delighted to have here Mary Green from Wageningen University and Annalisa Muller from Bielefeld University. And I'm sure either of them might want to connect, correct my pronunciation um, when, when they get the opportunity to do so. Um, we did have a third paper that would have been in the session from Katja Niergaard. Unfortunately, Katja's um, needed to withdraw. So what that means is we'll have a little bit more time for the, the two papers today and also a little bit more time for discussion at the end. So I'm going to hand over to Mary in a moment, but just before I do so, um, a couple of reminders about format. Um, Mary will talk for 20 to 30 minutes, I think, today. Um, what we'll do is have an opportunity for questions and comments immediately after that, because I know that Mary needs to get away a little bit later this afternoon, so we want to make sure we, we have some discussion immediately after Mary's paper before she needs to leave. Um, then we'll move on to Annalisa for 20 or 30 minutes and again some discussion after that. Um, we've got some time in the second hour that we may or may not use in full, um, but one of the things we'd like to do um, in that second hour is have a discussion about the papers today, the papers from the series as a whole um, and the way in which the series has gone as a whole. Um, perhaps next steps after um, this seminar series, and I know that Jessica and Kirsty um, have some ideas for what the Mass Observation Archive might do next year that might be of interest to some people on the call. Um, so, during the talks, we're going to ask everyone to turn their mics off. Um, feel free to open the chat function and write to each other in the chat, um, and then after the papers, I can either read out questions from the chat or people can use the raise hand function or just turn on their cameras and mics and we can allow people to ask their own questions and make their own comments. So, um, Mary, if you're about ready, can I ask you to, to share your slides and, um, and introduce uh, your talk? Yeah, no problem. Uh, sure thing. You can see the slides there. Yeah, great. Yes, okay. yeah. Just make them big. Um, so thanks, Nick, and everyone for um, uh, inviting us along to discuss um, some other non-UK, I guess, perspectives and research that's been conducted on the impacts of COVID-19 on everyday lives and practices. Um, so my name is Mary Green and I am based at Wageningen University. You were very close there, Nick. It took me a while myself to, uh, to get the hang of it from Wageningen into uh, <laughs> eventually mastering Wageningen. So, uh, but uh, yeah, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not from Wageningen, um, but I'm actually from Ireland. Um, so I came from the National University of Ireland, Galway, where I worked with Francis Fahey um, and uh, conducted my PhD there using biographic methods with uh, practice theories to look at how daily lives and practices have evolved in Ireland over time. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk to you about, and I apologize, apologize that the title has changed uh, here. I was hoping that a colleague um, would also be present from a, a project that I'll introduce to you now to discuss another paper we had uh, just written recently on temporal dynamics of daily life. But instead, I'm going to discuss uh, with you a, a paper um, on daily urban mobilities and um, that's specifically engaged in a cross-cultural analysis of how um, routine mobility practices have been disrupted um, during uh, COVID-19. So as you can see um, there, I'm not the only author contributing to this paper and we have a team of people. Um, so um, uh, from Oslo, Johannes Folden, Catherine Ellsworth Krebs uh, in Lancaster, Manisha and Artham Parmain uh, in California and Emma Fox in NUI Galway. So I'm representing uh, the team here today. Um, so uh, just to give you a bit of insight into uh, the, the broader pro uh, project, 
that um, uh, this paper is uh, emerging from. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, um, I work with practice theories and um, I'm not sure um, how do many of you here or um, you know, we're everyday life researchers. So I'm sure people are aware of, of the field of practice theory work. So we um, started a project here in Wageningen um, uh, with through our international kind of consortium of kind of consumption practice theory scholars. Uh, we began a project where we said we'd use a shared methodology to um, engage in qualitative work with uh, citizens in different countries um, around the world at the same time. So we took an urban focus and essentially uh, there were 11 urban sites where we conducted uh, in-depth qualitative work that involved um, interviews uh, and also photo diaries uh, with participants. Um, so some of the, it, it was a mainly European um, site, but we also had uh, Asian and uh, USA uh, perspectives, uh, Beijing and Hanoi in Asia and uh, Seattle uh, in the USA. Uh, so this generated um, a massive database of interviews. I think we had like 260 something uh, interviews and photo journals. And we also then um, had teams writing, kind of keeping track of uh, more contextual developments in terms of uh, COVID measures uh, um, and regulations coming out in, in the different cities. Uh, so that just provides a backdrop to the, the, the paper. And if you want to learn more information, you can have a look there at the website. I'm just back from maternity leave, so the website hasn't been updated uh, in, in the last um, couple of months, but we, we're going to be updating it with more information of a special issue that we have coming out now um, with about 13 papers coming out of this data set and also um, some additional um, papers um, of projects not included in this data set. Um, so um, yeah, so just to give you an idea, then we had uh, the 11 countries or urban sites, we have 27 researchers involved, um, over 250 participants and um, uh, over 250 um, interviews and um, uh, photo journal surveys. So um, essentially we're drawing on practice theories, so social practice theories as a, a way to kind of um, look and ex explore disruption. Um, so yeah, essentially we're interested in understanding uh, what the disruption can reveal about the underlying dynamics of social practices, as well as how uh, we might intervene and change them for improved sustainability of daily lives um, in the longer term. Um, oh, I'll just admit this person because I'm a, a co-host. <laughs> and um, yeah, so essentially uh, there's quite a gap in understanding variation in practices across cultural contexts. So using this multi-sided urban um, framework, we hope to maybe say something more about how culture and practice interact um, uh, and, and what that might reveal for um, sustainability transitions. So we also have a, a Twitter uh, page that has not been as active as we'd hoped, but um, we will, yeah, we, we divide it into a number of working groups. Um, so the paper I'm gonna to present to you in a moment now is from the mobility working group, but we also have other working groups um, in the consortium looking at food, time, space, well-being, and social differentiation. And each of these groups then um, have uh, analyzed the data um, to make a contribution to um, work in, in these areas. And they'll be part of the special issue as well. Um, so the special issue is, is coming out in um, the Sustainability Science Practice and Policy Taylor and Francis Journal. Um, so we actually have the first paper, I think, coming out this month, and then they'll be following on a roll, coming online on a roll by roll basis. And then um, the, the full special issue then will be ready next year. Um, so that's just to give a bit of background context to, to the project itself. Um, so now I'm going to discuss one of the papers which is focused on um, uh, disruptions in daily mobilities. Uh, 
so essentially the starting point for, for the paper is um, that um, there are, are culturally distinct and shared ways in which COVID-19 has, has disrupted practices. And um, by uh, starting with um, trying to say something more about how culture and practice interact, we, the disruption of the pandemic provides kind of a unique empirical context uh, in that it's a dis this disruption and um, an event that has disrupted and reconfigured our systems of provision in many different sites across the world. So previous work on disruptions and practices has tended to uh, be focused on certain localities um, um, and shorter term disruptions, for example, um, a blackout or uh, a drought in a particular locality. So um, COVID-19 then in its systemic scale and influence provides um, an opportunity, uh, if we can use that word, or um, an, uh, a moment, I guess, to which to kind of say something more or study um, how systems of provision and daily lives interact. Um, so there's been an, an, a lack of comparative practice work to date, um, and especially qualitative practice work. So we sought to help address that gap as well. And, and in doing so, we've we chose uh, three of the kind of distinct um, mobility cultures out of the sample, um, um, Oslo, Dublin and Seattle, and we sought to engage in a comparative practice analysis of how COVID um, has impacted daily mobilities. Um, so the conceptual framework in the paper then, we integrate uh, three key camps of literature. Uh, so the first is uh, a body of work on mobility cultures and um, mobility, I'll tell you a bit more about that now in a moment. The second is social practices. And the third is um, literature on disruptions um, in socio-technical transitions, but also in practices. Um, and we argue in the paper that by integrating these three perspectives, we can say something more about how culture and practice interact. Um, uh, so going to culture and practice then, um, what has been said about uh, the interaction between these um, two concepts? Well, there was a special issue um, published just recently with Welsh um, um, Bente and Margaret Keller um, as editors in, um, I think it's cultural sociology. And in that they kind of review practice theories and the practice turn in the sociology of consumption and identify um, remaining kind of areas that have been you know, underexplored or under theorized to date. And one of those areas is um, this um, realm of the cultural and, um, and how practice theories have, have been able to speak to that. So on the one hand, while culture um, um, is kind of, you know, fundamental to practice theories as, as they are cultural theories um, and they, you know, social practices in essence reflect the cultural fabric and way of life of particular societies. Um, you know, they reflect shared meanings and general understandings, and these are inherently cultural. Um, you know, previous work and theories draw attention to, you know, conventions and norms. Um, but in the in the special issue, they argue that despite this inherent cultural um, um, aspects of practices, explicit theorization of it um, within practices through comparative frameworks, and um, as well as attending to you know socio material aspects of cultures, that these have as of yet been underexplored. So that's a starting point then for combining practice theories with this mobility cultures framework. Um, <clears throat> and the mobility cultures framework in contrast has you know, emerged out of a focus on a comparative analysis of looking at different socio-material settings and how they shape uh, travel patterns. Um, so Holston and Nielsen define a mobility culture as a specific socio-cultural setting that consists of travel patterns, the built environment, and mobility-related discourses. Um, so essentially then, um, this field has concerned itself with looking for differences and similarities across different sites in terms of mobility cultures and how that uh, leads to certain patterns of practices on the ground. Um, so another um, mobility cultures framework has been offered by Defner et al. And they 
um, argue that, you know, mobility culture comprises of a range of, of socio-material elements such as the built urban uh, space, um, the politics, um, uh, the urban planning histories uh, that shaped, you know, how the infrastructures have developed. Um, as well as, you know, the lifestyles and um, um, kind of, uh, you know, discourse and feel to living in a city. Um, so these interacting dimensions then provide a framework for looking at how we might uh, compare or, you know, measure and define a mobility culture in a specific locality. So in the paper, then we combine a practice approach and a mobility cultures framework to look at a mobility culture as a um, setting specific kind of bundle of, um, of practices um, and that um, amount to a, a mobility system. So disruption then, um, as in the paper, we look at this as an empirical context in which to study and make uh, some advancements on, on how to understand this interaction between culture and practice. Um, and um, Noel Cass and colleagues, they define disruption as an opportunity that can reveal the situated nature of, of practices um, and their embeddedness within social and cultural com complexities. So in, in essence, then disruptions is a, like a fraying of normality, um, which can reveal insight into, you know, um, normally obscure um, uh, relationships that might lock practices together. Um, so then, um, in terms of our methodology, so as I mentioned, we had these three urban sites and um, we combined um, in-depth kind of contextual qualitative analysis of citizens' mobility experiences with the contextual analysis of mobility contexts um, in terms of the infrastructures policies and the broader modal shares of, of different travel patterns pre-COVID and during COVID. Um, so um, on the on the website, we we have some insights into the type of data we got around, like the photo journaling, um, and uh, it, that's just to give a picture of that. So mobility featured strongly in in these um, photos and, and journals that participants uh, submitted, um, and um, we followed up with those participants then for in-depth interviews around uh, their changing mobility uh, practices. So if anybody wants to see more of those kind of um, uh, pictures, they can look at the website. Um, so mobility cultures and trends across context then. So after the analysis of the kind of mobility context uh, part, we defined or we tried to um, make a typology of the three cities according to what we saw as kind of um, something that stood out about the cities. So Oslo, we um, positioned as a public transport metropolitan, and Dublin as an emerging cycling city, and Seattle a, a congested car city. Um, so we also mapped what was happening to different um, mobility trends using um, Apple mobility data in the three cities. And we could see there were kind of distinct patterns. So in um, Oslo, for example, uh, public transport more quickly bounced back um, and um, in the other cities, it stayed um, at quite a low, uh, public transport being the purple line here. Um, and in the other cities, they stayed at uh, quite a low level throughout 2020, this is now. Um, you can also see that in Ireland, um, other forms of mobility stayed quite low as well, whereas in Seattle and in Norway, um, they bounced back quicker. So these kind of contextual trends, we were interested in exploring how they were playing out at the scale of, of daily lives. Um, so within Seattle, then, um, the contextual analysis kind of revealed, you know, a really deep rooted kind of car centric planning and infrastructure landscape. Um, and that also came through in participants accounts where, you know, uh, evidence of a really deeply rooted kind of 
what we called automobility rationality emerged in, in their accounts. And by this, we mean that um, the, the COVID disruption had very little um, impact on, on desettling car driving as a dominant practice in participants' lives. Um, and rather, they were only temporarily affected due to, for example, lockdown. And then as things opened up, um, uh, they were um, car driving was increasing again, and um, they, they only um, temporarily then were affected. There was no a significant change. In Oslo, then, we found that like similar things, so a city with a well-developed um, multimodal transport system, um, in participants' accounts, it was clear that public transport was very embedded within practices um, in a way that, for example, wasn't clear in the USA sample. For example, usually people would travel to work by train. Even um, most people who had a car, they never used it for getting to work. They chose to use public transport because it was easier. Um, and um, so it was embedded within a range of intersecting practices that made up the daily lives of citizens. Um, and reflecting this, public transport showed a smaller decline and a quicker return here in the purple line. Um, we also saw in participants' accounts that the citizens in um, Oslo uh, discussed you know, getting back on public transport very quickly, even when the pandemic was still in operation and lockdowns were still happening. And, and they, they're their interviews uh, had a lot of insights into how they were developing kind of new embodied competencies for navigating riskier public transport terrains, for example. Um, but public transport remained largely accessible and a normalized mobility practice. Um, so that was in contrast then with Dublin and Seattle, um, where in Seattle, most of our participants had not been using public transport before. Um, and in contrast in Dublin, those who were uh, using it, we're reporting using it less and not planning to return to it anytime in the future. Um, so a quote from a Norwegian um, participant um, um, at the time of interview in, um, I think it was early or late May 2020, uh, he was talking about how he was continuing to take the tram and that, that it was filling up more and more. Um, in Ireland, we have um, somebody discussing um, the, how they will not be using public transport for a long time, and it'll be always the car now. Um, whereas that participant used to use public transport for these kind of um, outings with her husband. Um, another Norwegian um, uh, interviewee talking about, um, you know, this. Um, development of certain types of competencies uh, for you know navigating riskier public transport terrains so when i take the metro um you know i'm keeping distance there are all these stickers on the floors everywhere i have a different awareness about how um um everything she's doing and everything everyone else is doing uh, compared to um what uh, i did before um, so she's constantly wondering if she's doing it correctly, washing her hands. And so I think we can all relate to, to those kind of uh, comments. Um, sorry, it's not. Oh, Dublin then was a really interesting case because it's been um, there's been a lot of kind of civil unrest um, in the pre-COVID period about um, asking for better uh, cycling infrastructure. Um, so it was identified as a starter cycling city um, and in one publication as inspirational for the rest of the world based on its ambitious plans to develop further um, infrastructure. But um, in the preceding years, there was kind of unrest among, amongst activists and citizens because these plans had never been realized. Um, so there was an, impl an implementation gap and, and real concerns about safety with Dublin having one of the highest um, um, mortality rates for cycling. And um, it was very interesting to look at how uh, within participants accounts, many of them were out cycling um, because due to the safer roads, the council had brought in temporary uh, cycling lanes and um, many people were, were starting to use them. So this suggested that, you know, what was happening pre-COVID in, in terms of uh, city plans and development um, was mediating uh, the ways in which um, disruption was impacting um, 
mobility practices in the different sites. Um, so in the paper, we talk about how it's important to um, situate um, an analysis of disruption within the context of, you know, longer term uh, practice culture trajectories. Um, so it's not enough to just look at what's happening now, but to, to consider the broader uh, culture um, of, and trajectory of practice. Um, so this is just a quote from an Irish participant who um, was reflecting on uh, why she wasn't a regular cy cyclist pre-COVID, um, even though she liked her bike, was, is because it's quite, um, it's frankly terrifying to cycle. Um, but right in the middle of the pandemic, I felt safe to go out and it was absolutely a joy to cycle. Uh, there was space, there were fewer cars parked on the roads. So the roads felt wider, there was less traffic uh, driving around. So I hope that people and the council have learned the value of good cycling infrastructure. Um, and, and this was quite uh, widespread. We were surprised to see um, um, that the discourses around cycling pre-COVID had uh, clearly made its way into uh, people's experiences of, of the disruption during COVID. Um, in, in contrast, we have uh, Nancy here in the USA discussing that um, you, you know, for a trip to, to the grocery store uh, around a mile away that um, within her neighborhood, it's just not something people do to go by foot or bike. And um, in the interviews, um, it, she further discussed, you know, how dangerous it was, how there was no cycling lanes, you know, the, she was surrounded by large motorways, things like that. So, um, yeah, so essentially, um, the, the key argument in the paper, um, that we make is how disruptive events impact practices and impact daily lives depends on already existing um, cultural governing and infrastructural contexts. And that um, urban um, contexts and um, wider kind of histories of governance uh, and practices mediate the impact of disruption on um, uh, practices and lives. Um, so comparative work then is useful for kind of shedding light on um, the, some more contextual elements um, or um, that maybe remain more um, obscured uh, without a comparative lens um, and that we need to account for broad landscapes and practice trajectories if we're thinking about um, looking at the impact of disruption, whether it's from pandemics or um, other scale disruptions. Um, so yeah, and, and essentially that this would suggest that, you know, change at a systems level uh, and, and longer term approaches to designing um, changes are, are important when we're thinking about the implications of the, this analysis for, um, you know, intervening in daily practices. Uh, so yeah, so that's just one, one of the papers uh, in the special issue and happy to discuss and answer any questions about this paper or anything else to do with the, the broader project. Hey, thanks very much for that, Mary. That's um, really interesting. Sounds like a great project. Um, one of many projects, I think, at, at the moment across yeah. the, the social sciences, probably that have been... That have of course, I am, just a second. So, at least for me, it looks good. Yeah, so, um, great. Thank you so much. Um, and best regards and apologies from uh, Leonie Pütje, who has been working on this project together with me. She can't be here today. She's engaged in teaching the whole day and um, is very much looking forward for everything that I will be reporting to her from our uh, session uh, this afternoon. So um, what I want to present today is, um, on the one hand, uh, selected, uh, selected findings from research that Leonie and I did together, but especially a focus on the discussion of the method that we used. And um, our project connects rather well to what uh, Mary just presented, I think, because we also looked at social practices and how they transformed, modified, were altered in times of uh, corona, in times of crisis, as we call it as well. And we had a particular focus on social infrastructures. 
And those infrastructures that remained open in Germany, that was our, our research site during the pandemic, especially during the first month of the pandemic last year. So to give you a short overview of uh, the scope the, um, regarding the content of the, the research, um, we had, a, as I said, a focus on social infrastructures and on their role within cities. We have done research together on infrastructures in cities before, and I'm particularly interested in the, what we call social material um, arrangements um, and interconnectedness of the sociality and the materiality that you can observe when using social infrastructures and looking at urban life through infrastructures. So our focus here was on the sociality, the materiality and transformed spatial arrangements as a kind of background. We are both human geographers. I have a training in sociology as well. So this is how we are, this is kind of our, our lenses through which we look at social infrastructures. And the case studies that we did in a compared to, to Mary's project, rather micro um, research, were um, social infrastructures that remained functional in our research sites in Germany that were supermarkets, takeaway places such as cafes, restaurants, and farmers markets. These were those selected infrastructures that remained open and where we all had to um, adjust our routine, routinized practices of using them. And this was kind of the starting point of our research. And to give you a short um, background information on the situation in Germany, um, I've listed it here, what happened last year in the in early spring when we started. So before COVID, so, called, so to say, um, Leonie and I had started working on social infrastructures in the, in the various aspects. And on March 12th, the federal government of Germany and the 16 federal states in which Germany is divided, agreed upon guidelines to restrict social contact, with, which was called in Germany as a kind of a adaptation of English wording, social distancing, which meant in fact physical distancing. So the, the guideline to have at least one, at, uh, one meter 50 uh, distance to one each, uh, other was called social distancing. March 15th was kind of the, um, the start for us when we experienced the massive changes in our professional lives as well because uh, the universities shut down um, almost all other kind of not key um, uh, locations shut down and we were kind of sent to remote work. And then in April, Leonie initiated a kind of a dialogue on this current state of social infrastructures and how we could as human geographers, social geographers could try to make sense of these changes. And what I want to focus on today is collaborative autoethnography as diary project, as I call for the, the context of today. Um, the method we used for our research on social infrastructures is inspired by what Roy and Kuse call collaborative autoethnography um, and described as a quote, a mode of quote, uh, studying society through ourselves. And this is a very useful method, or at least for, to us, it was a very useful method to kind of reflect and integrate us as individuals, as citizens of a state in our research and acknowledge that we were affected, massively affected by this pandemic as well. But when trying to use kind of the classic, the traditional qualitative methods, um, we encountered first, if you use participant observation, for example, massive um, uh, problems because regarding the social distancing measure, etc. cetera. Um, but also it was a kind of an ethical question that we posed to ourselves. Is it 
Um, can, can we uh, do research on people and with people who are living in a time of crisis and use kind of our own living in a time of crisis for our own professional, re professional research? And what um, we found so inspiring with this method of collaborative autoethnography was that key elements of this method, of this collaborative method, are self-reflexivity and collaboration. So what this particular mode of, auto, of ethnography is about is to take into account that you as a researcher are also part of the social situation, something that ethnography always does, but kind of turning it into an advantage for your research and integrate your own perspectives on changes your own modified practices of using social infrastructures, for example, as data. And, and this is, I think, the important point, use it in a collaborative manner that is use it, do it as a team and exchange your experiences, ideas, your observations, and reflect this in, in our case, in dialogue together with the, um, your research colleagues. The, this method we applied comprised observations, informal interviews, visual documentation, we um, sketched what we found on the streets. And before I delve more into some findings and some method related findings, um, I present, shortly present the case studies to you. It's two German cities, Hanover, a rather big city and capital of the federal state of Lower Saxony and Feren is a town in Lower Saxony, the same federal state. So here you can see it located. So we're kind of in the Northern middle part of Germany, South of Hamburg, kind of the key reference point maybe for you to recognize. And this is where we were. So the advantage was we were in the same federal state with the same government regulation, the same policies, because during these COVID months, every one of the 16 federal states had their own policies. So traveling through different states were slightly difficult, but here we had kind of the same settings uh, framing our research. And we used this kind of collaborative autoethnography as I call it here, inspired by your um, project as a diary project in times of Corona. And I now took two of these key descriptions of the method by Roy and Acusa um, to describe the method and of the, the, the value of the method as we see it for research, for qualitative research in times of crisis. So when we take the um, the guideline of studying society through ourselves um, series, then we reflect our own positionality. We two researchers were literally stuck in selected neighborhoods. Leonie um, kind of uh, moved between two neighborhoods in Hanover, me uh, only in one neighborhood in Pferden. And we are, this is all part of our positionality, middle-aged white female researchers with academic background. This kind of is the essential things that you uh, reflect upon when you do ethnographic research or all kinds of um, social scientific research, I would say. What we had as text or what we have as text, as data are text and visuals, written observations, self-observations, photographs, sketches, minutes of informal interviews, um, quite a set of data, but as I said before, as it is a kind of a micro research, it's not such a huge amount uh, compared to the data that uh, Mary and her team have, but um, you all know that it uh, adds up, uh, especially photographs and sketches and so on. And then it's the question what to do with it. And here's a kind of a selection of 
especially photographs, sketch of the farmer ma farmer's market on the um, bottom left. Um, the farmer's markets had a rearrangement of their material physical settings to allow for more distancing between the customers, um, establish certain um, pace shields between the customers and um, the, um, uh, the shops. So we uh, sketched that normally um, uh, with pen and paper and then transformed this to the computer. We uh, took um, pictures in the streets with all these different um, modes of rearranging uh, social infrastructures, and then on the in, uh, in the bottom in the middle, uh, the upper middle part, you see the first uh, version of my community mask. Um, community masks are by now forbidden in Germany. We have to use um, medical masks, but these were kind of the first first steps of using um, community masks. So this is kind of an impression. This is the the visual. Um, documentation of what we encountered around us. If we then take the second and third guideline of collaborative uh, autoethnography series, self-reflexivity and collaboration, this, this is how we try to uh, realize it. We analyzed the, the data that we had individually and then collectively with qualitative content analysis, segment analysis, especially for the photographs, and especially this self-reflexive and collaborative mode applied for the interpretation of data through, and this is one of the um, modes I want to present in more detail now, through collaborative autoethnographic vignettes. This is kind of formulating a diary that you can then use for the interpretation of the data, for um, presenting results. We also use it for um, publications or try to use it. And in these vignettes, we try to, on the one hand, give an impression of the personal, the emotional um, experiences of crisis, of irritations, of routines through Kind of the person of the uh, the researcher, the the person that writes the vignettes, and then analyzing it through using deductive and inductive categories, kind of a, a mixture of uh, novel and classic qualitative approaches. And this is how a vignette could look like. Um, you state the date, and this is a condensed version of two different observations. Like this is kind of the, the second step. First you have the observation and then it's a condensed version highlighting certain elements of, um, of experience, of transformations of social practices and all altering social practices when using infrastructures. And we combine it with the visual data that we have to illustrate what we encounter and kind of make text interact with visuals. And if you get go a little closer to these vignettes, I've highlighted certain elements here. It vignettes are about documenting and reflecting the routines, the routines in this case pre-crisis and in the crisis and what at least we in Germany call the new normal. I don't know if this has become an international expression. Um, so I write here, for example, what I tend to forget over and over again is that I have to use a trolley in the supermarket. Normally, what was normal in pre-corona times, I take a basket and not a trolley. So kind of explic explicating what um, you experience in this particular situation, the way it's a thick description of your experiences in everyday life. And then it's also about integrating emotions, documenting your own argument, kind of talking to yourself in your head. And the second example on the bottom right, when I approach the doors, I wonder, I decide not to be obsessed with two, 
too much with details. So here you can already see that this is not kind of only descriptive documentation of what happened in the particular situation, but also enriched through my own thinking, my emotional interpretation of the situations of the at times kind of bizarre situations that um, we encountered during these times. I promised to talk a little bit about ambiguities of sociality practice and materiality. Kind of, I leave now for a moment the methods part of this um, research and present some findings in a nutshell. So, what we see here, and this also connects um, very well, I think, to what Mary and her team um, found out, and the kind of on the on the realm of the social infrastructures that we see modes of restructuring urban life through particularly altered social material configurations. We have these distancing measures. We have certain materialities that are used in supermarkets to ensure the, um, that you keep a distance. You have to use it or you had to use a trolley, for example, to make, kind of make people adhere to the the distancing measures, we had to use face masks, there were visible spatial material rearrangements on the streets, in the shops, you were only allowed to enter through one door and exit through another door. And these new practices can be described as particular social practices of using social infrastructures. The question here is, and I think it's an un yet unanswered question, whether these are temporarily new, temporarily altered social practices, or whether practice, this is really a, mo a moment where we see new routines evolving. And what was extremely highlighted in these months, I think, was the important role of materiality in learning how to use infrastructures and learning in you how to use them. And what I think can, and then I'm back to the methods in a way, but I think what these collaborative autoethnographic vignettes can, can do and can do as a, as a method is to highlight how we adjust to social practices, but also um, how we need to adjust the practices that we have routinely uh, routinized, that we have incorporated, that we have adopted, that we have become used to uh, through our socialization. And how urban social materialities are used, and finally, how urban conviviality plays out. And I think these vignettes are really good tools um, to reveal these ambiguities of sociality practices and materiality in times of crisis and times of Corona in this case. In a way it was, and um, this is something that I want to talk about under the, the head of ambiguities and collaborative ethnography. They were also um, kind of, um, I don't know the right English expression for it, but um, we were not really sure which kind of methods to use in this particular situation. So it was kind of, when we, came across this method, we thought, well, this could be a way out of this not knowing how to research now in this very different situation. So on the one hand, collaborative autoethnography and research that is inspired through this um, method allows us as researchers to acknowledge our own involvement, kind of related to um, making explicit your own positionality, both within the social field in which we are situated and in the crisis as a particular social temporal situation. It demands a lot, it demands high level of reflexivity and self-reflexivity, always trying to address your own blind spots using your collaborators. And um, this reflexivity is also um, necessary for always reflecting on the statedness of the phenomenon. 
in spatial, political, social, and generally temporal terms. This pandemic is placed out in a particular way in the northern part of Germany, for example. There are structural similarities to other parts, but this is um, a particular situatedness of the phenomenon. And this method is really facilitated if you are um, able to closely collaborate and exchange intensively with colleagues, with other researchers. Um, so it also enables you to reflect your own ambiguities, especially in times of crisis. And in this way, it's kind of self, uh, self reflection in this sense as well. And, and here um, I come to kind of the downsides maybe of this method, or what I call ambiguities of collaborative ethnography. Of course, the qualitative data is affected by the length of in-depth research. In our case, it was rather short. It was kind of an ad hoc ethnography that we did last spring. It is affected by the positionality of researchers. We had particular insights so it's to our sites and through our particularly framed social fields. And regarding the research process, we have to say that in our case, as it was kind of this ad hoc research, it was in a way systematic and systematic. We didn't spend one year designing and framing our research design, but we decided in kind of two weeks time, we try to use this now and try to make sense of what's going on around here. It is selective. And it is also, but this um, holds true for a lot of research, embedded in overarching research on infrastructures, in our case, and the kind of particular understanding, especially in my case, for the interconnectedness of materiality and sociality. And when, when we come to the aspect of research ethics, and uh, Nick, you already mentioned that in your question before, um, there were fundamental questions that we, we posed to ourselves um, during the research, namely, is this our way to use a crisis to enhance our scientific records? We do research on a situation that is for a lot of people really um, frustrating um, and uh, difficult. And is this kind of research also a kind of coping strategy for our own living in the times of crisis? This kind of, um, I didn't want to end with a very negative perspective on this method, but I think these are very important aspects to cons consider when we talk about this particular mode of ethnography, this particular mode of researching in times of crisis. And I will leave it here. I have could talk on for, about the uh, findings in relation to content, etc. So um, feel free to ask questions on that as well. But um, I leave it here because I think this methodological questions are really a very interesting uh, aspect to uh, discuss about. So thank you very much.